Hello, everyone. This is the Insider Threat Podcast, an ISO 3103-1980 compliant show where we explore issues with the human factor and its impact on security and business. I'm your host, Steve Higdon. In this episode, we cover Veterans Day, user awareness training, and more. Don't touch that dial. Welcome back. This is episode 26 of the Insider Threat Podcast for the week of November 13th, 2017. Once again, this episode is ISO 3103-1980 compliant. That's what happens when I get the chance to record at night and on the weekends. If you're listening to this on Monday, I want to say Happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans out there. I've made it a point not to be political at all on this show, so I won't go down that route. No matter where you stand, I hope you can find it in your heart to be thankful for a person who has sacrificed a portion or the entirety of their life in service to their nation and everyone in it. I don't have any specific announcements for this week, so... It's time for your InfoSec Question of the Week, where Google is king and the prize is non-existent. The question last week was, in 1964, John G. Kemeny and Thomas E. Kurtz designed the original basic programming language. Where were they when they did this? The answer was Dartmouth College. Now, I don't remember what basic was like, but I remember QBasic, which was invented by Bill Gates to be a simplified version of basic. That's basically, get it, basic? That's what we used in my original computer classes. I believe it was in elementary school. I'm probably dating myself there. But we used QBasic to write simple programs and then eventually play games on the computers that we made ourselves, or at least compiled ourselves. And that's really, if I'm thinking back on it right now, that's what got me into computers right away. Well, that and my father, but that's a story for a different day. Congratulations to Eusebio from Pasadena, Lynette from Salinas, that's two people from California so far, Walt from Indiana, and Alan from Aldergrove for getting the correct answer. Here's your question for this week. In 1984, David Ruderman and Eric Corley launched a periodical named after a specific tone that could get early phone freakers into operator mode on telephone systems. What is the name of this periodical? Send your response to infosecanswer at gmail.com. Be sure to include your first name, location, and the hashtag HOPE. This week's discussion topic is user awareness training. So we have to ask ourselves first, what is awareness training? And I guess you have to break it down a little bit further. Awareness, in my opinion, and I'm not the Webster's Dictionary here, awareness is having knowledge that something exists. And training, of course, is a method of instruction or teaching someone a particular thing. But if you put them together, awareness training, it doesn't really make that much sense because you're not teaching them awareness. Awareness is something that's derived from training that you would learn about something, but training is actually teaching you an action, something that you have to do. And awareness isn't an action. It just means that you know something exists. Now that aside, you're going to see me using this term, awareness training, throughout this piece. Not necessarily because I agree with the term, but because that's a common vernacular for the subject that we're talking about. So now that we know what it is, kind of, we can then ask ourselves what it looks like. Now, there's two basic types of user awareness training, and that's in-person and virtual. In-person user awareness training uh, will differ quite a bit from organization to organization, but it, it's typically some sort of presentation or slides, maybe even in some really creative organizations, they'll get into role-playing a little bit. And then virtual user awareness training will be done on a distributed learning environment, or maybe those slides just get sent to everybody in the company. They have to type their name in on the last page saying that they've gotten the training and then email it back to the compliance person in the organization. I've seen that before. But it could also be a video. It could be a gamified set of scenarios that the user has to go through and possibly answer some questions. 
And then oftentimes there's a test or a quiz at the end to kind of check your understanding of the material that was presented. Which is the best? Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to answer that here because I think it's going to differ depending on the organization. If you have a smaller company, let's say you're between 15 and 25 people, then in-person training is obviously ideal. It's going to be cheaper than buying some sort of distributed learning environment. And you can actually get really close and personal in your classroom instruction to ensure that the users actually understand the material that's being presented. In large organizations, on the other hand, it might not be practical to have in-person training, If you, especially for organizations that have remote users all over the state or country or maybe even world. Sometimes in that sense, virtual training through a distributed learning environment or something similar just makes more sense. Now, another question that I get quite often, and I see people arguing about it all the time in our industry, is how often should training happen? And this could open up a whole discussion on the difference between compliance and security. And we've talked about it a little bit in the past. Compliance, in my opinion, is a standardized way to test the security of an organization. For example, and this is an easy one, if you look at PCI or the payment card industry requirements for their compliance, it's a set of standardized rules that anybody who processes payment cards have to abide by. And what you've got to understand is, although the problem that they're trying to solve, thank you, Michael Santarcangelo, is security in a lot of these cases, the reason for standardized compliance is actually for auditing. Because if compliance isn't standardized, then how can an auditor come in and actually do a quick and cost-effective job at measuring your company's compliance. It'd be very difficult. Now, some might argue that compliance actually goes against real security in an organization because the leaders in that organization might be more concerned about checking off those compliance requirements than actually securing the data and the key business functions and capabilities that rely on information technology. And even worse, so much worse, a lot of these organizations, and I've seen them firsthand, they'll think, and I can't really blame them for it, they'll think that if they're compliant, then they must be secure. So all of their money will go towards compliance and not the actual security on top of it. Because while compliance may be the stick, security is the carrot. But that carrot costs money. Money on top of what they're already paying for their compliance. Now, I think we've gone off on that tangent quite a bit, but what I was actually getting at back with user awareness training and how often you should do it is a lot of organizations only do it as often as their specific compliance requirements call for. And typically, from what I've seen, that's about annually. Now, I've given this shtick before as well, but I'll say it again because to me anyway, it's important. You have to ask yourself, is a 20-minute video slideshow presentation or quiz once a year enough to keep your users aware and making the right decisions? That's what you have to ask yourself. And obviously, or I hope obviously, the answer is probably no. Out of 124,800, I just did the math, hours in a typical work year, and that's working eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. And I'll say it again, 124,800 working hours for the average person, only 20 of those are spent learning about security. You don't have to be a genius there to see that it doesn't make any sense, right? So while some people might answer that how often is based on your compliance requirements, I say it's how often based on the results that you're trying to get from your training. Now, how do you measure the results of your training? That's a great question. And I think it depends on the organization. Some would say whatever the user's score was at the quiz at the end of the training, that's how you measure the success of the training. But if you're going to go that route, I say the week before your annual training, you should have them take that test. That's the results of your user awareness training program right there. Because if it doesn't last the whole year, then why the heck are you doing it annually? Now, some other measurement tools might be the number of insider incidents in your organization throughout the year, or maybe the number of reports that are sent in. Whether they're legitimate or not, the fact that a user suspects something is out of place 
and sends in a report that, in my opinion, is the greatest measurement of the success of your user awareness training. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if they're aware. It doesn't matter if they know that these threats are out there. It doesn't even matter if they know the reporting requirements or how to identify the threats or what to do if they identify those threats or they suspect something. The goal of the training is for them to not do bad things and report when they suspect other people are doing bad things. And all this feeds into culture, which is a topic for a different show. But I've seen several people just looking for solutions to their security culture. But in reality, an organization's security culture is the culmination of those other three pillars that I talked about which are training, technology, and policy. Only through effective use of all those can you even think about improving your culture. Now, implementing your user awareness training program can go several different directions. It can be homegrown, like we said, with things like videos and slides and presentations, that sort of thing. And you can distribute those exact same presentations and videos through a distributed learning environment. That's very common. But there's also vendors that specialize in this space Specifically, and ones like Ninjio, uh, Wombat, No Before, these are ones that just come off the top of my head. But I saw a thread on LinkedIn just today, and it kind of warmed my heart about this industry. Someone was basically asking for an all in one InfoSec, so basically user awareness training toolkit that was on premises, specifically not in the cloud, and it encrypted all the user data that would be used in this tool. So in this thread, and if you're a LinkedIn ninja, you can probably see my latest posts and things like that on my profile. You're probably better at it than I am, I promise. But you had Jason Honich, the founder of Habituate, and Jason, if I'm butchering your last name, I sincerely apologize. You had Nick Santora, the CEO at Curricula, and you also had Zach Schuler, the founder and CEO of Ninjio. And the best part about this whole thing was that almost none of them were actually trying to peddle their wares. These are CEOs and founders of some of the biggest user awareness training vendors on the planet. And what were they doing? They were actually trying to have a discussion on effective awareness training. And Jason Honich from Habituate even said, like, if you want to have an actual discussion on awareness guidance outside of a vendor pitch, please direct message me. And obviously, because I'm doing this podcast on Insider Threat, because I have a passion in this very niche field of information security, I already follow all these guys. So to see all of them in the same discussion, just trying to talk about the subject and not trying to sell their wares, that was huge to me. That that I know it sounds really corny, and I apologize if you're offended, but that warmed my heart a little bit. I said, this is an awesome community where these founders who are in charge of these awesome companies in this specific field. They just want to have a conversation, not about their product, but about the problem and help this person find the best fit, even if it's not their product. Now, because of that, and because, yeah, they are actually making a huge difference in the insider threat space, all three of you, Nick, Zach, and Jason, get a gold star in my book. And they're not sponsors or anything, so I'm not mentioning them for anything like that. They just did a really awesome job at trying to help solve a problem. Thanks, guys. So now that I've buttered them up quite enough, I want to tell you that it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive to be effective. And what I mean by that is you don't have to have one of these very robust training platforms in order to educate your people. I know of an organization, and I'm not going to say who they are, but every time the user logs into their computer, they're presented with a question. And I may have mentioned this before, so bear with me. But everybody gets a simple question. And it's something that's easily Googleable, and it's not against the rules to turn to your neighbor to ask them what the answer was. But that's not the point. It's not about getting the correct answer. It's about either one, you're researching a real InfoSec problem on the internet, or two, even better, you're talking about it with the person that's sharing the cube with you or the next cube over. How many organizations can say that? How many can honestly say that every single one of their users is thinking, researching, or talking about information security every single day instead of those 20 minutes that we talked about earlier? And something like that 
is not hard to implement. It can probably be automated, and I really don't see it costing that much either. Now, if you wanted to go deeper than that, you wanted to use their answers as part of your their annual performance report or something like that, sure, you could go that route. And in that case, you probably have to have some sort of platform to record their answers and compile them and grade them in some way. So yes, you would have costs associated with that. But just asking the question and getting them talking about it is relatively free in my mind. And I know free is an absolute but it should be pretty inexpensive other than hiring somebody to implement it with a message of the day or something like that. So my next question is, what type of training do you do at your organization? Is it the typical, and don't feel bad if this is what you guys do, the quiz or PowerPoint slideshow that gets sent around and everybody signed the, the last slide? Is that what you guys do? Because that's typical, that's normal, but I'm not saying that it's effective. But even then, if you found a way to make that work and a way that you can actually measure results that you're improving your organization, please tell me about it because I'll share it on the show and I'm sure there's a lot of people that would love to hear some tricks of the trade for making that an actual effective thing instead of just a compliance requirement. But also, if you were king for a day, and some of you are in your organizations, what would you change about your user awareness training? What would you do to improve it or make it more effective? Share that with me too. We're all on the same team here. Every single one of us that's listening, and me included, th this is a podcast for us so that we can actually learn together and grow together, and even more importantly, improve our organizations together. Let's share this information so that we can get better across the board. So I'll say again, let me know if you have any tips or tricks or what you would change if you could. So now let's get to the news for this week. A Minnesota man paid people to DDoS his former employer for over a year. Now this man was John Gamble, and he was charged with paying for sustained DDoS attacks against his former employer. And these attacks cost the company, which was Washburn Computer Group, and that's a company that repairs point-of-sale systems, approximately $15,000 over the span of this DDoS attack. And he's charged with paying between $19.99 and $199.99 per month to DDoS Washburn Computer Group, Hennepin County, and I suspect that's where he lives, and the Minnesota Judicial Branch, as well as some banks. This guy was pretty nasty. And here's where it gets fun. Mr. Gimmel, or Gamel, I guess it was, was caught because he sent some taunting emails to his former employer using accounts that were created from his house and accessed by his phone. Talk about being caught red-handed. Now, an important point here is that DDoS and other similar services are cheap now. I, I already told you, you can pay as little as $19.99 a month, or especially in this case, to DDoS a specific person or organization. And it's also important, let's bring it back to reality here, we have to be careful how we treat other people, because that could have a really big impact on how they treat us. I just started a bigger managerial role, and I won't tell you how many people I'm managing, but basically I'm in charge of IT for an organization with a lot of users. But you got to be careful about how you treat your employees. If you treat them badly and they style themselves as part of, uh, sure, I'll say it, part of Anonymous because I was part of this story here, they might try to find a way to retaliate against you and your organization. So that's why you have to treat everybody with dignity and respect, no matter where they are on the totem pole, because anybody today, as long as they have a job and as long as they're paying their bills, they can afford 20 bucks a month to DDoS your organization. And like I said, that was $1,500 in impact over the course of a year, or it was a little bit over a year. Now, moving on, our thought of the week comes from my pick for the best lightsaber duelist in the Star Wars universe, Master Yoda. He said, do or do not. There is no try. So thank you for listening to episode 26 of the Insider Threat Podcast. Please remember to subscribe and review in your favorite podcast app and also share with everyone you know. 
Those reviews are key to building this out and improving for later episodes, so please feel free to leave suggestions. You can contact me on Twitter, at Steve Higdon, or send an email to steve at theinsiderthreatpodcast.com. Join our Reddit community and discussions at the subreddit named Insider Threat. The subreddit is also where you'll find the show notes for this and any other episode, as well as links to the topics we've covered. If you go to our website, you can find a link to the Patreon page, and you can subscribe to the newsletter to get up-to-date information on current episodes and news for the show. Call and leave a voicemail at 443-292-2287 to have a conversation, get a comment added to the show, or even ask a question. Thanks again. And I'll see you folks next time.